Good morning, people. Good morning. Um, I am here today, this morning, to talk about my uh, hell experience that happened uh, approximately February uh, of 2000. Um, and that was a long time ago. Today is May the 1st, 2022. So I'm 50 now, so that will give you an idea about how long ago this took place. Um, but let me first start by saying I, I have nothing to gain or profit by sharing this experience and information with you. Uh, the only thing that I have in my heart um, that I really want to express is uh, concern for those that don't believe um, that there is a hell. And I really fought this um, for a long time. And like I said, I'm 50, I'll be 51 in November. And, um, you know, the Lord has really just been impressing upon my heart to let this be the first of many videos. Uh, as he's been walking me through a period of repentance for the last about a year and a half to two years since this pandemic started and burning some things out of me but i don't want to get into that too much there'll be another video um after this one that will start to get into salvation and um deliverance and re repentance um from sin and, and basically uh, uh that that kind of information would be shared at, at that time but uh so i make this brief because i don't like real long <laughs> youtube videos myself but um, so I was laying on my bed. I think I had to be around, oh man, let's see if I'm 50, that had to be, uh, so 2000. Oh, so I had to be right around what, 30, 29 or 30 years old. And, um, I was laying in my bed in my apartment. I was a single man. I just had my oldest daughter, or I think she was due that year. And my uh, girlfriend, her mom, who would be my wife later on down, like a year after that, she moved out. So I moved in one of my frat brothers at the time to help me with the rent because I was in an apartment uh, that was kind of uh, priced over my, my head. So I needed some help. So at that time I was in my room. He was sleeping in his room. I think he had to work the next day. And um, I know I did, but about maybe close to midnight or something. I kind of, I was, I remember I had a VHS tape in the VCR and all of a sudden I felt this, I wasn't even asleep. That's was, that, that is what is the, the scary part is that I wasn't asleep. I wasn't knocked out. I could feel myself sort of drifting off like, oh, you know how you're in the bed, you're tired and you can start feeling yourself drift, but I wasn't asleep. And all of a sudden I just, there was this, this force that's just started pulling me down. And when I say pull, it was just suctioning me down. I had no control over any of my members. Um, and next thing I know, I am in a weightless black atmosphere. Um, and in this place was complete and utter hopelessness. Um, I could sense that there were other souls around me or people, whatever you want to call them, what I thought they were at that time, I didn't know. Um, it wasn't a dream. Uh, <laughs> it was actually happening. And um, the one thing I became um, aware of almost immediately was the fact that God's presence wasn't there. I tried to pray. That was the first thing. You know, I was born and raised in church, although I spent many years in sin and outside of the will of God. And at that time, I was definitely outside of the will of God. And um, so the best way I can describe it is somebody locking a five-year-old up in the attic at midnight and leaving the house. And that's the type of terror that the terror that you feel in this place is, is almost um, indescribable. You can't really put it into words. But I can tell you when I tried to pray, I felt a physical feeling of my prayers falling back on me. 
And that's when I became very terrified. I knew that God's presence did not exist there. He doesn't exist there. He just is not there. And the atmosphere is a weightless atmosphere. It's pitch black. And the other thing is when people tell you that, you know, I'm, I'm claustrophobic and I'm like, you know, you might ask, well, what does that feel like? And they may tell you, well, claustrophobia feels like the walls are closing in on them, like they're alive. And that's what it is there. So this place is actually called outer darkness. It is a part of hell that I think is reserved for people that knew God and walked away from him. By all accounts, I think this is what the Bible is trying to say. Um, and I'm no Bible scholar um, by any means, although I do study the word. Uh, but I'll point out some scriptures about this. But this part of hell, you know, there's many legs of hell, right? Um, there's many different um, chambers of torture. Some people describe being in, a, in a, a cave or a cell, an earthen cell where their body burns up and reactivates and, you know, into a skeletal form. But this particular place, it, I wasn't any of that. I didn't see any demons, nothing. All I can tell you is that it was pitch black hopelessness. God's presence wasn't there. And I knew I was doomed for eternity. I knew this was this was it for me. Um, I had arrived at the place of my final destination. And unfortunately for me, that was outer darkness part of hell. Um, now, I just want to cut real quick and read something, uh, an excerpt from a book that I read, you all may know, God Bless Her Soul by Mary Kay Baxter called Divine, A Divine Revelation of Hell. If you have not read that book, I would encourage you to read it. It is eye-opening. It's, it's basically just to surmise about a woman who fasted and prayed for, I believe, 40 days. It's been years since I read it. And um, she fasted and prayed for 40 days, 40 nights. And each night, Jesus' spirit or presence would come actually show her a hell and bring her back. Um, and she wrote some other books followed up, you know, after that one. Uh, I think the next one was Divine Revelation of Heaven, where he followed up with showing her heaven. Um, now, you can believe that if you want. You know, I, I think it all depends on where your faith is. But for me, uh, I don't think there's anything wrong in believing this This. You know, if it were me and I, I was not a believer, but Christ is the head of my life. So I do believe. But if I wasn't, I would just kind of err on the side of, you know, a word to the wise is sufficient. You don't know what's on the other side. And we all have to go somewhere. We all have to give an account for this life. Everything we did in this flesh will become ever present before God one day. You believe that if you want, but it's, uh, it's the truth. Um, and many people that have died and actually gone to heaven talk about a life review where you know, everything you did here on earth, good and bad, plays out on a big screen as if in a movie before you and God. Um, so um, I didn't see that part. I saw hell. So um, part of the book, uh, just an excerpt from Divine, Revel uh, Divine Revelation of Hell by Mary Kay Baxter. And this is all, you know, just excerpts and paraphrase. So just, just a little bit. She says, um, as we walk on through hell, Jesus and I came upon a very large and very dark man. He was enshrouded in darkness and had the appearance of an angel. He was holding something in his left hand. Jesus said, this place is called outer darkness. I heard weeping and gnashing of teeth. Nowhere before had there been such utter hopelessness as I had felt in this place. And this is the part that, that struck me, the second part I'm getting ready to read. So that was one I... Then she goes on to say, there was a fire in the middle of the disc and blackness on the outer edge. And the angel held his hand beneath the disc and reached far back in order to get more leverage. He, I guess he was throwing this, this disc with all these souls in it. This, this is how she saw it. But here's the thing. When I was there, this is the part I didn't tell you yet. I was floating in a weightless atmosphere. And down way in the middle, in the center... There was this orange hue, this light that you could see real faintly. And I said, my God, that must be the center of hell down there. And I was thinking, I don't want to end up down there. I, although I'm hopeless and lost where I am in this pitch black darkness that was actually alive. It, it penetrates you. The walls, if there were walls, they were closing in on me. It was like alive. The darkness was alive there. Um, and so I, I knew at that point when I looked down and saw that orange hue that there had to be you know, some kind of part of hell, hell, like hell, fire, hell, where demons and everything were. And that made it more terrifying because, you know, you're in a weightless atmosphere floating. It's like a black, pitch black merry-go-round. You, you're just floating there. And 
The other part of this real quick, she says, Jesus knew my thoughts and said again, this is outer darkness. Remember that my word says the children of the kingdom shall be cast out into outer darkness and there shall be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Lord, I said, you mean your servants are here? Yes, said Jesus, servants that turned back after I called them. Servants who loved the world more than me and went back to wallowing in the mire of sin. Servants that will not stand for the truth and for holiness. It is better that one never starts than to turn back after beginning to serve me. And that's pretty much it for that part. Then in scripture, Matthew 8, 11 and 12, it says, And I say to you that many will come from east and west and sit down with Abraham, Isaac and Jacob in the kingdom of heaven. But the sons of the kingdom will be cast out into outer darkness. There will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. And then uh, Matthew 25 and 30, and cast the unprofitable servant into outer darkness. There will be weeping and gnashing of teeth, the unprofitable servant. So what does that tell you? That's somebody that, that served or was following God at one point. First Corinthians 6, 9 through 11. Do you, do you not know that the wicked will not inherit the kingdom of God? Do not be deceived, neither the sexually immoral, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor men who submit to, to or perform homosexual acts, nor thieves, nor the greedy, nor drunkards, nor verbal abusers, nor swindlers, will inherit the kingdom of God. And that is what some of you were, but you were washed, you were sanctified, you were justified in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ and by the spirit of our God. And then the follow-up to that, this the verse I just read is actually not about outer darkness. So I want to make a point. Luke 5 and 32, I have not come to call the righteous, but the sinner. So the reason I read those last two is that no matter what you're involved in or what you've done, how immoral you've been, what kind of sexual lifestyle you've led, whether there's been any, any addiction in your life, whatever you've done outside of blaspheming the power of the Holy Spirit and, uh, itself, then you can be delivered and you can be saved. Um, and so that's really what I wanted to say um, about uh, about this, other than the fact that there is hard evidence. If you read, if you Google outer darkness or you YouTube, and there's other videos on here I've seen too, where people have described this, this black atmosphere part of hell where God's spirit does, he's not there. He doesn't exist. You can't even pray to him. And the reason I know that is one of the reasons is here on earth, where we are right now in this body, there is a common sense of God. His spirit is everywhere. It's omnipotent, it's omnipresent, present, it's omniscient. He's just, he envelops the whole earth. Even in your sin, he's there. When you are fornicating, when you are committing crimes, when you're doing the worst things that human beings can do, believe it or not, God's presence is actually there with you. And I know that because I went to a place where he didn't exist where his presence wasn't there. And it was the most terrifying feeling I've ever had. And here's the crazy part, is after I experienced that, um, I went back out in the sin, you know, years go, days go on, years wean by, and you know, you go back to living a normal life and the memory of that experience, you soon forget. Um, I'm just now at 50, uh, starting to get, get myself in a position with the help of God to, uh, live a life free of habitual sins, things I've been involved in, drinking and partying and, you know, all kind of stuff. Two failed marriages. Uh, you know, I'm, like I said, I won't, I won't get into all of that in this video, but it definitely has its place because I want people to know that you are not consigned to hell just because of your sin. In fact, it's quite the opposite. Jesus said he came for the sinner. He didn't come to call the righteous. He didn't come with those that, that sit up in church and wear suits and, and, present themselves as clean and just and living in secret sin somewhere. See, he came to call people like me and people that have been in, involved in sin and things like that. And you do have an advocate through Jesus Christ. I tried some everything. Nothing worked for me. Nothing has worked for me except sur complete surrender to Jesus, to the Lordship of Jesus Christ. And I know society is going in a different direction. People have changed. Things have changed. People and all kind of stuff. And you know, I don't want to want to dog anybody out or admonish that per se. Um, we all have to come to the knowledge of Christ in our own way. Um, my prayer is that you do before you die.
Because if you don't, uh, I think you might be in for one, one serious surprise at the seat of judgment. And at that point in time, it's too late. Um, now, God is sovereign. Nobody can predict his ways. Maybe he could, you know, you're going to be either uh, exonerated or condemned based on the words of your testimony and how you lived your life. You know, what can you say to him at that point in time if all you've done is evil and bad? Um, so, and trust me, I'm not free from any of that, you know. Um, but I think it, it really boils down to a matter of faith. And at some point, obedience. Some, at some point in your life, you just have to do what's right because it's right. You know, nobody should be have to line up a ton of scriptures and have you laying hands on you all the time. And, you know, all that kind of stuff. And that went on for me, too. You know, I, I was born and raised in church, but church wasn't always in me. And that's usually how it is with a lot of us that uh, were born and raised in, in the church. But, uh, you know, be blessed. I'm praying for you all and praying for this world we're in. And um, my hope is that through this video, you will begin to dig deeper into salvation and what that looks like for you. I don't know. Uh, like I said, I'm still in the throes of deliverance and salvation. Um, be encouraged. I would say read the word a little bit every day. You know, um, follow the There's some good study plans on the Bible app. Get with some people. If you need to cut people out your life, I've cut a lot of people out of my life. Um, all those kind of things, you know, add up. And and there is no one and done in this thing. Like, right, um, deliverance comes after many small victories, I'm finding out at the age of 50. You know, they want you to believe in these churches that, um, you know, no, you're delivered to heal. Somebody lay hands on you. Now, nine times out of 10, that's not how it works. I think it was... I